Up today, we're going to be speaking with Ben Kieran, an Australian-born technology entrepreneur and the CEO of Caffeine, a groundbreaking social broadcast platform. Ben, so great to have you on Speed of Culture. Thanks so much for joining today. Thanks for having me, Matt. I'm excited to be here. Absolutely. So we have all different types of people on the Speed of Culture podcast. We have people that work for major brands, and we've had our fair share of entrepreneurs, and those are always some of my personal favorites because I love the, you know, the the journey being an entrepreneur myself of how to get a product from early, you know, inception to to a full blown company, and you've done that many times over. And would just to love to hear from you. What do you think you experienced during your upbringing that enabled you to be an entrepreneur? Hey, that's a that's an awesome question. Thanks for asking it. Um, look, I I think just growing up, I I always just loved building things that other people could use. And it's look, I grew up by the beach in Australia, like surfing, that was my jam. But yeah, um, you know, just loved building computers, working with computers actually was like a self taught programmer at 10 years old. Um, wow. And uh, yeah, just really got super passionate about the idea of making things that other people, you know, could get some use from. I just thought it was the coolest thing ever and feel really fortunate that I gravitated to that at such a young age. So you just had a calling that technology was something that interested you. Was there anything that initiated that or is it just sort of something that you feel like it was in your DNA? Uh, you know, so I'm um, in my early 40s now. And so it was like, you know, really kind of early 90s where, you know, Yahoo and the internet and all these things sure. sort of taking off. Like we're talking like 386s and 486s and, you know, XT computers, like if they were before those, you know, that, yeah. that kind of time. And I just thought, you know, it's similar to maybe building like a Lego set or something. Like it was just so fun putting a video card in and installing RAM and then like the chipset and then building software on the computer and like, my mind was just so blown away as just a little kid on like the, as a creative outlet. And then when I saw that you could make things that other people could, could use and hopefully get some value from, I, I just was drawn to it for sure. And, and, and like, you know, as I said, from like 10 years old, like, I, I, I mean, one quick side story is like, you're at school um, with like doing like the yearbook for like grade five or something. Um, and like who's your hero and everyone else is writing like you know michael jackson and all this kind of stuff I i'm writing like dennis ritchie like the the founder of uh c plus <laughs> plus so yeah there was something in it something about it that i just was so excited about and clearly am even even today yeah and in 2003 you found your first company blue pulse tell us about the impetus behind that company well yeah sure so um i mean i haven't told this story in a long time but um when sort of wireless technologies like 802.11b uh, Wi-Fi started to emerge, um, Bluetooth was you know another sort of technology. I, w I became so fascinated with the capabilities of those technologies, and I actually built um, this little uh, uh, remote control out of my Bluetooth mobile phone. One of the first ever Bluetooth mobile phones, the Ericsson T39. It was in Tomb Raider. Do you remember like the boom headset in Tomb Raider? Sure. Like, that, that was like the Bluetooth thing. Anyways, I thought it was super, super cool. So I got my hands on that and I ended up making like a, a remote control for my mobile phone. So you could like come into my apartment, which was about the size of a shoebox, And uh, the playlist on Winamp, the MP3 music play would like appear on the screen of the phone and you could use it to, to change tunes. And so this, this got me like really into sort of mobile application development and ultimately led to me building Blue Pulse, which was a Java application that gave people these really rich messaging capabilities and things that you used to see on the internet, but um, on desktop computers, but people in South Africa and India at the time had never really experienced that. And so when I brought it to like the phones, it just it exploded. <laughs> yeah. And it seems like it all came from, again, you just having hands on keyboard, so to speak, understanding how to use the technology and really being more of an inventor in some ways, right? Because I think a lot of software or tech entrepreneurs today like myself included, don't necessarily know how to code, so to speak. And I think, you know, there's so many no coding environments and what it means to be a tech entrepreneur today is a little bit different than it was back then, because then you really had to be more so technical in order to build things because there was no square space to build a website or, you know, no code environments, Git, GitHub, et cetera, to, to put things together. Yeah, totally. Absolutely. And, um, and, and that's what I loved about it. It was a space that, you know, I understood really well. 
Um, I'm definitely a play-based learner. I like to just figure things out on my own. Um, you know, there are plenty of subjects in school that I did not do well at as a result. Me and you both. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but just really love the freedom and, and, and the, you know, what I was able to do with computers and just, you know, keep following your heart, your passion, like keep digging into the, the problems you're trying to solve and one thing after the next. But yeah, that's where it all started for me. <laughs> awesome. And then you would go on to become CEO of a company called Chomp, uh, which mm -hmm. over time would be acquired by Apple. Um, tell us about Chomp um, and that journey um, leading up to Apple acquiring it in 2012. Yeah, so um, look, I'd been around mobile phones and mobile apps for a long time. In fact, not a lot of people realize, but Asia, Southeast Asia was like really ahead of the curve compared to say the US. In fact, yep. I remember coming to the US in about 2004, 2005, and people were just like, what, you're building like stuff on the internet for phones and like right. Symbian applications and Java applications? Like, People were still getting used to text messaging. And I was like, this is odd because I grew up in the 90s with like a Nokia phone, like at right. school, like playing snake under the, the table and I'm meant to be paying attention in class. Like I was just really familiar with it. And so as sort of smartphones and iPhone and things like this were sort of um, coming along, Palm, all these sorts of things, I kept thinking about um, the people that were successful on sort of desktop web. Um, and that generation of the internet, you know, what would be the successful applications and how would they be different in the mobile world? And I had a lot of experience with mobile. And so obviously content discovery was a huge issue um, on on the web with like companies like Google and Yahoo and everybody else solving those sure. kinds of problems. When it comes to apps and media, it's a different problem, right? There's no, you know, TFIDF, term frequency and document frequency. There's no metadata, anchor text. There's none of this kind of stuff. And so you have to come up with a completely different solution for how are we going to search um, for like apps and content and those kinds of things. And so I just really felt that, you know, based on the experience I'd had in life, that this was going to be a huge problem, worked on that. Um, the business was going quite well, but um, Apple ended up stepping in and saying, hey, we could really use that technology over here and it ended up with them. So what was that process like to sell a company to Apple? Because that's obviously an iconic company that, uh, you know, puts privacy in the highest, highest regard, design in the highest regard. It's not like selling to maybe an advertising holding company, I would imagine. Walk us through like that, what that experience was like. Yeah, for sure. So, and, and look, at the time, I hadn't really heard of too many companies that had ever really sold to Apple. I mean, they right. didn't really... They've done more acquisitions in the last 10 years than what I'd seen in the previous 10 or 20 years. For sure. Um, and so it definitely was a very unusual thing, I think. Um, so what was it like? Well, what we were doing to get a lot of traction for our sort of content discovery um, technology was, um, was essentially powering other people's um, app stores and, um, and services. And so we would do licensing deals. And so we actually had a really big licensing deal which was beginning to roll out with verizon wireless it was going to like power app search on android phones um for verizon we also had a deal with yahoo where we were powering some of the search results in yahoo for app search things like that and the process was we were we were basically trying to work on the same deal with with apple so we were saying to them like hey like we should power content discovery for you guys um and like you know here's the technology here's how it works and I would say like over the course of six months, we just, you know, became really close with the engineering team and different folks. And it was all done in secrecy. And, um, you know, we couldn't sort of talk about this too much um, and, or at all, I should say. Um, but, you know, we, we became really close with the engineering team and it just got to a tipping point where they were like, hey, we're not gonna, we're not gonna license the technology. And I remember being in the room with executives and everyone else and going, oh man, like I was really hoping we could like, do this and they were like actually would like to, to buy the company instead and i was like wow Whoa. <laughs> um and so it's quite a hard choice um believe it or not because as much as i'm super inspired by apple and i love the company i really wanted to build a standalone company that yeah and it's like two feet so it was a really weird moment but that's kind of how it came about <laughs> and then you ended up staying there for it looks like three to four years um longer, what longer was your experience that, yeah. like working in apple were you focused on the product you had built or did you kind of branch out a little bit to some of the other product lines at, at Apple? 
Yeah, so, um, yeah, I ended up staying there a bit longer there. I ended up staying uh, over five years. Okay. Um, it might have been six, actually, in the end. But anyway, something like that. I loved it. Like, I loved working out. It was the only time I'd ever had, had a job. Like, before that, it was, like, my own startups. And, and, and like, it was the only time I'd ever actually worked for somebody else. Um, and the story goes, in the first year, it was really about integrating the technology and um, figuring out where the team was going to go. Like you, you don't get to stay as the same team you were, you sort of get built into the, the, the company. And for me, um, it was really unclear because I'm more, I've become more of a sort of technical product manager or technical product manager type CEO leader. Um, and Apple doesn't really have that kind of, of role. Um, right. And so the thing that was, I think, the, like pretty amazing of Apple was they allowed me to, um, as long as, you know, the team and the tech was getting integrated correctly and I had, I had all the support from that standpoint, um, really explore um, Apple and where could I, I help out. And um, interestingly, not even though I have mainly a technical background, um, I was invited onto the design team to be the design manager for Apple TV. Um, and One of my favorite products. That was an incredible honor because I was like, well, like, how do I lead these, the best designers I've ever seen in my entire life as a non-trained designer? Right. Like, don't do that. How's this going to work? Um, but that, that's what happened. And that's what kept me there because I loved it. It was like almost doing a startup in this big company. Yeah, it's um, doing a startup, but you're also, I'm, I'm sure, learning so much from the so people much. you work with and the organization, which probably set you up for what you ended up doing next. Uh, it, it totally did. It totally did. I, 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 it was like, I never got a university degree. I'm a, I'm a dropout. I was there for six months doing computer science. Um, here's the closest thing to a university degree for me. Like being right. in, in Apple, Apple university, Apple university. Was so great. after you left, uh, Apple university, you, you, uh, went on to found your current venture, which is caffeine, uh, which I really want to dig into because, uh, you know, did a little research on it. It looks super exciting and, and, and covers, and overlays a lot of the areas that I pay particular attention to. So tell us and the audience what caffeine is, uh, what the impetus behind founding that was, and, and what you're working on today with the business. Yeah, totally. So caffeine is a, a place where you can watch for free uh, live sports, not not the major live sports like NFL and NBA. What I would say is the majority of live sports, which is um, things like action sports and X Games and World Surf League, street league basketball teams, all the way out to like pickleball and all sorts of interesting things like that. So it brings really passionate communities together, creates a home for live streaming of sports. You can watch it on a phone, you can watch it on the web, uh, you can watch it on a couple of connected TVs as well. And it has um, over 40 million monthly active users here in the US under the age of 35. Um, and so it's an ad supported thing. You will see some ads on there. Um, and it does have some in-app purchase features too, but it's free to watch and a really cool sports streaming service that um, I think people really enjoy. And so how what, did you get, how'd you get the idea for, for this concept? Well, <clears throat> I am, um, as a, as a hobby, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a huge gamer. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, played a lot, like played in some of the top, World of Warcraft raiding guilds and all sorts of things over the years. And um, I'm a gamer. And so um, basically when Twitch came along, uh, I was working on Apple TV. They were moving from Justin TV over to Twitch. Yeah. And, and I'm also simultaneously in all of these executive conversations at Apple talking about the future of TV. And I just really felt that it was pretty clear, like the way TV broadcasting, live television broadcasting was happening on cable wasn't going to stay that way. It was, we were going to move to streaming like movies and TV shows, and there was going to be a new sort of broadcast network emerge. And so the, the question I had was like, um, is Twitch going to do that? Not just for gaming, but for all of live broadcast TV. Um, or if they don't do it, who who's going to do that? And, you know, it, as you sort of play that out, like a big element, I think of the future of live broadcast is interactivity is social is community is bringing people together to talk and interact around each other um and at that point in time and apple may be very different on it today just like 10 years ago um they weren't bullish on the idea of going into social and community and thinking about all those aspects of things but i became kind of obsessed with it thinking like 
wow, whoever does this is going to be new technology and new business models, and it could have a really positive and profound impact on on humans. Um, and so that, that ultimately it was something that I couldn't work on at Apple, and it's, it's part of the reason why I left and part of the reason why I started um, uh, Caffeine. And so, yeah, it's been, a, it's been quite a journey figuring out new technology and a new business model um, and the content rights and all the things that go with building what we're describing. But um, it's really working and it's on its way now. Um, and it's taken a few pivots to get there, but always with the same common vision of how do we build the future next generation live broadcasting network. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of themes in terms of what you're working on, one of which is just sort of the, it sounds like the long tail of sports, right? So you have... FIFA and the NFL and the NBA, but you know, you talk about you being a gamer and esports obviously falls in that category, or pickleball, which is an emerging sport. So, first of all, how do you find and identify and decide mm-hmm. I'm gonna go after this particular property? Like, is that based upon what your audience wants, or is it based upon what you're interested in and think might be cool to to, to broadcast? Well, the different phases that caffeine has been through was the initial phase was about, hey, maybe this new technology could attract a new kind of content creator. Yeah. Um, and it, it ended up attracting a lot of sort of small streamers ga- like in, in gamers and things like this um, that were familiar with Twitch, but looking at an alternative. And it was growing, but not growing quite fast enough. And, um, and it always, as I say, had the bigger broader vision of how do you build something broader than just gaming like gaming could be part of what i'm talking about for sure so right. can so could news so could fifa world soccer so could all these different things but what's the sort of wedge like the way to get into this market and really grow and not sort of cap out at being just a place for the gamers which is still big but there's more stuff than just 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 that out there um the phase two was um we had a lot of investment to sort of buy content rights and as we started to buy sports rights what i realized was a lot of these um, non sort of top 100 of those major sports, is, believe it or not, there's 11,000 of, of these other, that's why I'm saying like the majority, you could say the long tail niche sports, but I say like the majority of the sports that are out there, like 11,000 of them compared to like the top 100. Yeah. These guys like, um, they got really passionate audiences and they don't really have a, a, a home. And I was like buying the content and really seeing like, hey, it's really hard to reach these audiences. It's really hard to like sort of super serve these communities. Um, there's a lot of problems with it. And, and a lot of these guys, if we don't buy them, they're just putting their content on YouTube in different places already. It's really fragmented. It's all over the place. They might build their own website, et cetera. And so in comes kind of like Caffeine 3.0, which is like, okay, how do we work with these guys non-exclusively? Like what are the people that are already trying a non-licensing approach? And how do we sort of band them together um, and super diverse communities. And that's something that we've been really good at doing over the last 18 months with new technology and this business model. And so, yeah, we have a content team that's looking to add content density, but also add breadth of categories um, focused on, you know, what we think the audience will like, but we're specifically looking for, you know, folks that are out there trying to non-exclusively do things because we're not buying content rights. We're just working with non-exclusive partners aggregating them, super serving Helping them get them. distribution, right. All of that, that's exactly it, yeah. And, and in terms of TV in general, I mean, I would imagine you getting exposed to Apple TV, understanding where the TV market was going, you know, and, and understand we are moving to a streaming world, opened your eyes up to the possibility of where this is all headed. Moving forward, I mean, where do you see TV heading? I mean, do you think linear TV is even gonna exist? five to 10 years from now? And and how do you see this current, I guess, progression away from linear TV continuing to accelerate? Totally. So, yeah, I mean, I got um, just a front row seat at Apple um, on a lot of the most brilliant people I've ever met in my life, how they think about the market and, and where it's all going. And so even though I have mainly an engineering background with a nice design element there. I also got to pick up a lot of commercial aspects of things that you wouldn't get to sort of see as a, as a, just a regular tech entrepreneur. You get to make right. conversations and see that. So between that and, and now having lots of investment from cable companies and Disney and Fox and all these different guys in my board, I, I've seen and heard and looked at the market in a way that not a lot of people probably have, have seen. <clears throat> so where do I think it's going? I mean, I just give you that 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 experience that resume if you like um 
Look, I think that linear TV as it stands is kind of going the way of the newspaper, right? Yeah. Like it's still, it's still going to be consumed by a lot of people for a long period of time, but it is, it's a, it's, as we go into generation upon generation, like the next generation is not going to consume it like the previous generation. It's, it's, it's changing. And so what's it changing to? Well, there's really like two types of things that you would sort of consume on uh, linear TV. One is like movies and TV shows and the yep. second is live. And that may be an oversimplification, but I, I'm like, there's like live, which is generally sports and news. And, news, right. and then there's like movies and TV shows. Yeah. The movies and TV shows were the first to sort of go um, to streaming services like Netflix and other places um, because they actually got the, like the smallest share of the cable TV bundle. Yeah. Um, it was easiest for them to sort of leave whereas the sports guys get paid so much money that it's very hard for them to leave. The challenge for movies and TV shows and streaming services like Hulu and Netflix and so on um, over the long term is that there's just been a real shift towards shorter and shorter form content. Yeah. Like, TikTok. Yeah. And so so even when you're watching a movie and TV show as a kid these days, you're also on TikTok and Instagram and whatever else you're doing, but you're you're there's more of a trend going to for on demand content, like shorter form might get me the content. The thing that's interesting about live is I think it's impossible to imagine a world where um, you don't want to see my family versus your family or my state versus your state or my college versus your college or this person, this friend versus this friend, like competition brings people together around an outcome that they're all interested in seeing what happens. And even though the behavior is shifting towards shorter form content, live still brings people together for appointments, scheduled events, and for a longer a longer session, like 15 plus minutes, which is kind of crazy. Like I can't believe long form content's now at 15 plus minutes, but that's how it's sort of categorized this day. Yeah. So that's what I hear over and over again. And so I think for live, you're going to see it fragmented for a bit. So you, so like you've got the NFL Sunday ticket on YouTube right now. You've yep. got Major League Baseball that Fox mainly handles. You've got MLS that Apple's now doing. You've got on ESPN all the NBA rights and things are over there. And it's going to create a, quite a fragmented world for people for the next little while. But I think you will see sort of a reshaping and a re um, sort of framing of what we had on linear TV, but over streaming services. And I think it's going to get brought to you not just on, you know, phones and connected TVs, but I think it's going to be really successful in in VR as that starts to pick up as well. Yeah, because um, the live experience with other people in that is going to be epic. I think so. Yeah, yeah, I actually was just talking to the folks from Meta Reality Labs, and they were saying the same thing that they think both gaming and live sports are just huge applications of you know all these. I mean, Apple just came out with a new device and that usually means that it's ready for the mainstream if they're coming out with it. So yeah. I think that that's a new world. The other piece that I'm curious to get your thoughts on is just gambling. The ga gambling, fantasy sports, you know, the major leagues are now starting to adopt it and normalize it. And I mean, how far are we away from somebody watching caffeine and betting on a pickleball game? I mean, do you see that in the future of your platform? Yeah, I mean, for us, like we're going to be doing um, international Next year will be a huge focus um, in getting further onto connected TVs. Um, but further out, like I think that um, partnering up with with betting companies would be in, it, like phenomenal, especially with the real time nature of caffeine. That's a standout yeah. technology aspect of caffeine is that everyone's seeing it within milliseconds of um, the action, and so betting would be incredible. I think e commerce opportunities around it too would, would also be amazing right so you're watching something live and you want to buy a, i don't know a jersey or or, or or something that you're seeing sort of live and on screen right now there's a lot of e-commerce type opportunities i think around it um i also think that um ai to create like shoulder content around it and also used for sort of discovery um are all going to be like really interesting things that sort of make this format even more and more exciting and more easy to, for people to sort of sort of get into. But yeah, bet, betting I think will be huge. But betting plus these other things um, are all yeah, sort of absolutely. big areas. Yeah, <laughs> it's gonna be fascinating. So, um, kind of shifting gears a little bit, and just as we wrap up, you know, as an entrepreneur and, and running a company, it looks like you guys have raised over 150 million dollars from venture capital. We're in a uncertain macroeconomic landscape where you're getting, you know, your revenue primarily from advertisers. You're trying to stay relevant with consumers. It's a lot to juggle. 
Um, I think only the best entrepreneurs will get through times like we're in today, but the ones that do are going to have a huge, um, you know, business on the other side. Um, yeah. What What do you do as an entrepreneur to, I guess, stay grounded, make sure that you're deploying your resources and your time in the right way so you can execute on the vision that you have for the business? Yeah, I mean, for me, I'm I'm always thinking about the long term, and I'm thinking about um, how to build a real a real business, you know, for the long term. And yep. there's choices that were made like years ago at Caffeine um, to keep things lean, right, and to really just focus on on our user um, and. Today, you've got a business that has no, no marketing costs, right? Like, I mean, okay, we have, a, we have a PR firm that we're working with, but basically there's no quote unquote like marketing. We don't even have a marketing leader on the executive team. There's no content costs. It's all non-exclusive content. So it's like infrastructure, which we're really good at, and we own the full video stack and we're actually still driving down cost on that. In a fairly small, small team, it's like 60 people. Um, and that's it. And so that gross from like 3 million to over 40 million in the last year has all happened, uh, without any marketing, without any content costs. And we're doing it more and more and more. And so as we monetize with ads and also sell in app purchases, even in this, this market, that's really tough, caffeine's thriving. And I think it's going to thrive even more. Uh, you're right. You know, as we, as we sort of come out of it. And so for me, I'm like always thinking about the long term. I'm thinking about the user. Um, and I'm really trying to create a real business um, out of this. And I've always been that way. And I'm, it'll be eight years in April uh, next year. And um, I'm just super passionate and obsessed with it. And um, just going to keep doing that. <laughs> yeah. And what are you doing to make sure that you're keeping your finger on the pulse of the consumer and the changes? Because we talked about so many different innovations, whether it's, you know, VR or AR or gaming or streaming, the, the world's changing so fast. How are you able to stay, I guess, on top of what's next? Yeah, so um, first and foremost, I talk to our users every like every single day. Um, it's like I, I literally like wake up, I log into Caffeine, I'm like talking to folks. I, um, I'm always uh, sort of trying to have my finger on the pulse of what's happening. I also... Um, I'm a, I love the data as well. So I'm always looking at the data and seeing what, what's going on. Yep. Um, but then outside of that, I, I am, um, I'm a real user of like, even though I'm now like 41 years old, like I'm, I'm on all the platforms every day, whether it's TikTok or YouTube or whatever. And, um, doing a lot of work in Hollywood and LA as well. And having a lot of sort of celebrity investors and other people, I, I really try and get my finger on the pulse of popular culture and what's happening. Um, and it's just life for me, like to, it's just who I am and what I really enjoy doing. So it's not, it's not really work to talk to users or look at the data or talk to different, you know, famous people in LA about what's going on or like look, use all these different sort of social and internet services. I just love it. And, um, it just helps give me a good feel for, for what I think is, is coming and what's happening and connecting it up with sort of the market information and, and the data and what you hear from board members and other you know stuff that's yeah going on. yeah yeah absolutely so so to wrap up here i mean you obviously had uh, have had an awesome career and have worked with so many cool companies and you know i definitely get the feeling you're just getting started obviously we never know what we should know when we're young and we're kind of making up as we go along but if you had the opportunity to tell 20 year old ben something uh based upon what you know today uh, what would you tell him in a way that maybe could help some of our younger listeners here at the podcast? Yeah, I mean, um, I think that the younger Ben probably wouldn't, like would hear the advice, but probably wouldn't actually be able to, to do it because I was just always just so in a rush and like just, yeah. just so excited that like I just, I, I, I wouldn't, think about things too much or just go, like just keep going and just work like all the time and just be like drinking from the fire hose. But I think in the end, like being strategic and patient is really like the key. And it's something that, like, and that's what I'm saying, like if you could think about the long term, think about the user, think about the problem that you're trying to solve 
and it's it's something that you're just super passionate about like it's going to be there tomorrow it's going to be there next week it's going to be there in a month like it, it it all doesn't actually have to happen today what is important is that you're you're patient you're strategic and you're making the right calls as you move through it i think another like lesson is um is some self care like i yeah. i grew up i mean in my 20s like i would go sometimes three days no no sleep right like a lot of the time four hours and like that grind like i couldn't do that anymore and and that wouldn't be the way to build build a company um but it felt like in, ingrained in the culture of silicon valley at that point that that's what you had to do to be hardcore and i would just say like you do have to be hardcore and you do have to work hard but you also have to get sleep it's your job to get sleep and not look burned out and tired all the time exactly and, like, it's your job to stay in the game and and so be strategic be patient is is, is my quick answer <laughs> and then and finally here is do you have a saying or a mantra that you like to live by that helps you get through uh this rugged journey as an entrepreneur <laughs> well i have had written at the top of my to-do list for eight years uh the dream is real i'll always find a way <laughs> so it's about resilience right it's about believing in yourself and being unwavering basically that's it like you i think you, you you have to have a problem that you want to fix um a user in mind that you want to you know be in service to uh, you know a dream for like what that could could look like and just know that there's always ups there's always downs like life can't be like if, if 10's like the best moment and one's a bad moment most a lot of people just want to have fives like every day every day every day yeah as an entrepreneur you're going to have tens that you're going to have a lot of ones to get to the those tens and and so you have to believe and have that resilience that you will find a way to do the bad times and the good times just just breathe through it keep being strategic keep being patient and you get there <laughs> i love that awesome well listen thank you so much for your time today. it's been really awesome to get to know your journey and i'll definitely be uh cheering from the sidelines and following along as you continue to uh, build caffeine or whatever you do next Thanks, Matt. Appreciate it. On behalf of Susie and I, we team, thanks again to Ben Kieran, CEO of Caffeine, for joining us today. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review the Speed of Culture podcast on your favorite podcast platform. Till next time, see you soon, everyone. Take care. The Speed of Culture is brought to you by Susie as part of the Adweek Podcast Network and A Guest Creator Network. You can listen and subscribe to all Adweek's podcasts by visiting adweek.com slash podcasts. To find out more about Suzy, head to suzy.com. And make sure to search for The Speed of Culture in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts, or anywhere else podcasts are found. Click follow so you don't miss out on any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Suzy, thanks for listening.